Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails New Social Environment. We are hitting our 219th episode. Um, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC for a conversation between Yvonne Rayner and Amanda Glorvitzi. We're also thrilled to have the poet Jason P. Smith here who will read to close today's program. I'm Sophia Pedlow and I'm the managing director here. To begin, I ask you to join me in acknowledging the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation, the traditional owners of Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters on which we stand. And finally, the Brooklyn Rail stands in solidarity with the uprisings in response to the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDad, Nina Pop, David McCatty, James Skurlock, Jamel Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Rashad Brooks, Rhea Milton, Dominique Remy Fells, Toy and Salah, Walter Wallace Jr., and countless others we have lost to white supremacy and police violence in this country, and acknowledge that justice will come from the streets, from the nation demanding accountability, and refusing to move on until Black Lives Matter in the eyes of the state. Before I introduce our host and guests, we'd like to begin with a brief moment of silence. Thank you. And now to introduce today's guest and host, dancer, choreographer, filmer, and writer, Yvonne Rayner, American born 1934, is one of the most influential artistic figures of the last 50 years. Her work has been foundational across multiple disciplines and movements, dance, cinema, feminism, minimalism, conceptual art, and postmodernism. And Amanda Gluabitsi, our wonderful host today, is an art scene editor at the Brooklyn Rail, an art historian. She is the co-director of the New Foundation for Art History and the author of Art and Design in 1960s New York, forthcoming. Um, Amanda, over to you. Great. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, I just want to mention quickly at the beginning, for men, he joined all Donna Chaper, but um, she had a congregant who needed her today. And so we're thinking about them um, as we proceed through this conversation. Um, Yvonne, it is such a pleasure for me to be able to talk to you today. I'm, I'm truly, yeah, truly you. thrilled. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to start with a few biographical questions and then we'll get into the hard stuff. All right. Mm -hmm. So. Um, you briefly studied dance as a child. Um, I heard an interview with you where you said that you were in a tap dance class, but you were, it was just too embarrassing. And so your, your mother took you out of it for which you were grateful. But then you started taking dance lessons more seriously when you were in your young adulthood, in your early twenties. Um, today with things being so professional, that would be considered really, really late for someone to start taking dance lessons and then become a dancer. And so I just was really curious about this. Was it considered late when you were taking those lessons? Yeah, when I began to take it seriously, I was probably about 24. And that was, at that time, was considered late. It wouldn't be uh, that way now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the tap and uh, acrobatic as a child, uh, I uh, couldn't, uh, you know, and they'd stretch you and try and get your feet to touch the back of your head. And invariably I would fart and embarrass myself. And I, I just uh, implored my mother to let me uh, uh, leave this situation. <laughs> And then when I came to New York, I was studying acting. Uh, I had started uh, to work with a, a little theater group in San Francisco and I had some bit parts in some of their productions. And, uh, and at that time, uh, the Stanislavski method was all the rage and uh, uh, I seemed to be have no talent for it at all. And, uh, and a friend of mine was taking some uh, dance classes. She was a musician and studying with uh, a village um, dancer named Edith Steffen. And I went to my first class there and I, I didn't realize 
my physical limitations, but I loved running around and jumping and it took, yeah. But it took me a while to really think of myself as possibly a serious dancer. And uh, uh, at some point, oh, I had a one night stand and I got knocked up and I asked my mother, uh, I, I realized I had to start uh, reshaping my life and, uh, and take this profession more seriously and start stop fooling around, so to speak. I asked my mother for $500 a month so I could take three classes a day. And fortunately, she uh, was able to produce that. And, uh, and so that was the beginning of a profession, yeah, professional relation to choreography and dance. And you, you studied with major figures, again, relatively early in your career. Um, you, you studied with Martha Graham and mm -hmm. also with Merce Cunningham. Um, mm -hmm. For almost were with Merce Cunningham um, learning his techniques things that you mention quite often in interviews is that you didn't have the body dance at least as mm -hmm. dancer and choreographer thought that you um you talk a little bit about that yeah um uh yeah I, I was studying with Graham and and uh one day I was on the floor before the class started uh she was teaching with an assistant and uh I had my legs spread in second, but a, a very narrow range. And she came over to me and said, and I've repeated, I don't know how many times I've repeated this. Some of you may have heard it. <laughs> uh, when you accept yourself as a woman, you will have turnout. I mean, it wasn't clear. It's not clear when you're in that position, whether or not you have turnout, uh, spreading the legs, exerts one kind of uh, pressure on the hips and turnout is the rotation of the whole leg in the hip socket. So, uh, but anyway, that's what she said. And uh, well, I like to say that uh, neither one of those things came to pass. Uh, accepting myself as a woman, what does that mean? And uh, the body never changed really, yeah. <laughs> despite the body never changing, you were still able to study with them quite seriously. So what do you think it was about your dance that they saw? That who saw? That uh, Cunningham, Martha oh. Graham, your fellow dancers, well, your fellow choreographers? The, uh, yeah, I, at the Graham School, I, I was not making dances yet and uh, and I had seen Cunningham and I realized that uh, after a year at the Graham School that was where I was going to head and uh, uh, even though I very momentarily uh, fancied that I might join the company but then very quickly realized that it was not for me and I would have to make my own dances uh, to pursue a profession. And uh, so um, Robert Dunn mm -hmm. uh, was a pianist and a disciple of John Cage. And uh, he conducted a workshop in uh, 59, 60. Um, and I made my first dances, uh, solos in that uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Um, or do you think you are? Mm -hmm. What sort of a dancer do you believe you are? Uh, I call myself a postmodern. Uh, I mean, modern dance uh, really described the early pioneers, Graham and Humphrey and Isidore and Duncan. So uh, I and my contemporaries, uh, uh, many of whom eschewed uh, uh, their training um, were 
we were walking and uh, looking out the window and look at studying what people on the street did. And uh, uh, so we, uh, we called it postmodern and that evidently still applies. Um, one of the things that you learn when you see interviews with art, uh, actors or, or, I don't know, listen to um, the commentaries on, on a movie or something like that is how hard it is to walk naturally as an actor. That as soon as you're aware that people are watching you walk, it's actually really, really difficult to walk as though we would just be walking down the street or, or walking through our houses or mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. Is did you find that to be the case? Um, is it easier or harder to walk as a dancer versus walking as an actor? Well, yeah, uh, uh, doing nothing. That was one of my uh, uh, what ideals. How, how do you do nothing when uh, even two people are watching you, right? Mm -hmm. It becomes something else. That awareness, whether the people watching you are aware of it or not you are very aware that some, it's a different situation and relationship. And uh, um, uh, so that was a, a formative kind of uh, idea that, uh, uh, I mean, minimalism was coming in in the early 60s and it uh, influenced a lot of us. Uh, uh, Steve Paxton and I used to, uh, uh, say he invented uh, walking and I, I claim to have invented running. Uh, I made a dance that was totally, the movement consisted only of running uh, with a large group. Uh, and uh, he made a walking dance, you know. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I, I was always interested in, in using my training and uh, uh, what there was of it and combining this idea of ordinary movement and uh, and movement that required a certain amount of training even though I have used especially early on people with no training at all that uh, was a dominant theme in the early Judson uh, dance uh, uh, performances. Mm -hmm. Um, you said something that was really interesting to me in this answer about your awareness of being looked at and that once you're aware of being looked at, you, you hold yourself in a different way, your carriage changes and things like that. Is that. Does that have any relationship to your decision, especially most famously in Trio A, to avoid eye contact with the audience? Oh, well, those are two different things. Um, Trio A, I began working on this, uh, what, be, what became a trio. Uh, hold on a minute. Uh, um, someone is doing some construction in my <laughs> apartment. Um, where was I? Yeah, uh, 1964, 65. I started to work on uh, a solo that later became a, a trio. And um, uh, there were two uh, themes, you might call them, that uh, I was concerned with. Uh, one was not look ever looking at the, uh, confronting the audience with my gaze, because I had, I was very self-critical of, uh, uh, of my, the whole attraction of performance was uh, the pleasure in being looked at. So um, I wanted to undermine that in some way and cutting off my own gaze from that of the spectators was a way to do this. So every time I faced uh, the spectators and it required that they be on one side which meant a proscenium stage pretty much. Mm -hmm. Uh, I closed my eyes or I did something with my head or etc. And the other thing was um, I, I had a big elevation. I could jump and, uh, and as I began to make movement particles for this uh, dance, uh, 
I began to sense that uh, uh, a, a dialogue with the idea of virtuosity, especially in ballet, uh, the huge jumps, the preparation and the uh, apex of the elevation and the denouement of the landing. And I realized I was going to confront that or challenge that uh, uh, standard by evening out everything I did. So if I jumped, I made it smaller and smaller. Uh, there's, uh, there are leg lifts, uh, butt mount. Uh, it would go up and come down with the same dynamic. It wouldn't, uh, right? So that was another concern in that dance. And it seemed, it, it was kind of uh, revolutionary, you might say, at the time. And uh, I've taught the dance to untrained people and uh, uh, it does require, I mean, there's a misconception out there that anyone can do it, but uh, I've become more of a perfectionist. It's one of the only dances of mine that I have this uh, compulsive perfectionist relationship to. And uh, so I no longer teach it to untrained people, but uh, there are five um, uh, transmitters we call each other of, of this dance. And periodically I tune them up because the nuances of every moment uh, disapp can disappear, you know, even though there are videos of the work. So, yeah, I, I, that is one piece that I, I have done it in a convalescent way uh, when I'd gotten out of the hospital and I call it convalescent dance. And, and uh, recently, a few years ago, I did it in a, I call it a geriatric version. Um, so it has a life of its own and I keep adapting it uh, to my physical condition and to uh, uh, kind of uh, maintaining it, but dismantling it at the same time. That's um, basically a, a wonderful description of postmodern dance, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, when I first learned about Trio A, I was in college and was taking a modern dance class. And our teacher said, you know, we're going to be doing all the Judson stuff. That's what she said, the Judson stuff. Yeah. And so one of the dances we learned from her was to dance without making eye contact. And I have to say, I had taken ballet all of my childhood and, and was fairly serious about it through my teenage years. And it was such a relief to me not to have to make eye contact. With I always the, felt that the, the eye contact and the artificial with the, with audience, the audience, yes, or, the uh, eye contact. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 with the audience. Yeah, we were not uh, allowed uh, to make eye contact with yeah. our, our, of course, our fellow students were the audience, right? Uh -huh. um, but also the, the, the absence of the need to have a false smile mm. felt very, uh, very freeing to yeah, me. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Yeah, the Cunningham performers were criticized for having these stonewalled expressions. Uh, they weren't supposed to express anything. I, I never imposed that uh, mm -hmm. on, on my performers. I mean, if the, uh, especially in the recent work where uh, the sequence is not pre, uh, preset and uh, these different combinations of things happen at the same time. Uh, yeah, you're expressive, you're a human being, uh, you relate to each other, yeah, spontaneously, yeah. That's right, that's right. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, I've watched several Trio A performances um, in preparation for this interview, and one of the things I've noticed is that you can really tell the trained performers because mm. they have a hard time not pointing their feet. And oh. so this was a question I really wanted to ask you. Are people supposed to point their feet in Trio A? It depends on the movement. There are pointed feet. There are flexed okay. feet. Um, there's one uh, right in the middle. You have a pointed foot and it gets flat. That's part of the uh, 
the combination yeah mm -hmm. um so it varies yeah mm -hmm. yvonne mentioned that she she has trained untrained people to dance trio a and some of the movements are are look relatively easy to to perform but some of them look very difficult there's one point at which you bend over from the waist mm -hmm. um, and it looks like you're lifting one foot while you then bend over to um, point your hand oh, down yeah, at the yeah. ground that yeah. looks incredibly incredibly difficult okay. uh, no I, I wonder if i'm thinking of the same thing uh, you uh, take one foot leave one leg straight and the other foot is mm -hmm. an inch from the floor and keeping that relationship you start bending over as though your nose is going to touch your toe um, you get just so far but uh it, it it's a very subtle movement because it produces a very slight wavering of the foot that's off the floor and that was the idea yeah it is it is somewhat difficult yeah i i tried to replicate it viewers it was difficult <laughs> yeah <laughs> to the yeah. untrained dancer <laughs> yeah yeah one more thing about your your very early experiences i was really surprised when i was preparing for this that i read that occasionally you played the piano for merce cunningham dance classes is never, that true okay never I, <laughs> All right. no okay uh, oh that was another childhood nightmare i uh uh, my mother would accompany me when I was about seven years old to uh, take piano classes in, uh, and uh, I would, I, was, I don't know, I would, well, as part of my early unfortunate history, but I would have tantrums if I made a mistake and uh, I never pursued the piano. She let me uh, put that one by the wayside also. Uh, yeah, she, she, my mother's hopes for me were <laughs> continually dashed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one of the things that, that Donna was interested in asking you about, since she of course has a very close relationship to Judson, is about your relationship to mm. the Judson Memorial Church and also to Judson Dance Theater. Um, so how were you and your fellow choreographers introduced to Judson and, and what did that offer to you? Well, I had been going down to Judson to see the, the Poets Theater uh, in the balcony, uh, Joel Oppenheimer and other poets, and they were uh, doing readings and uh, uh, they staged a, an Apollinaire play and uh, also there was a gallery that showed the uh, early abstract expressionists and uh, well no post abstract expressionists like uh, Klaus Oldenburg and uh, other people uh, and when the uh, the uh, Robert Dunn's class had accumulated a certain amount of work we began looking for places to show it and uh, we'd gone some of us had auditioned for this uh, the 92nd street y uh, up on lexington avenue uh, an annual modern dance uh, series and we were all turned down i i i think i auditioned my first solo and steve paxton did something and uh uh, other people, uh, Lucinda Child shows something. And uh, uh, so I, I knew uh, I had been going to Judson to see these art and theater events. And uh, uh, I contacted Al Carmines, who was the assistant uh, pastor uh, at that point. And um, he set up uh, a, an audition and uh, three or four of us went down there and I performed something and Steve did and uh, and later he was and he accepted us he said uh, you can use the gym for rehearsals and you can uh, 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 have the sanctuary or uh, uh, whenever you want it and uh, and it was uh, such a relief because modern dancers up to that point 
uh, did this one, uh, saved their money and did this once a year per, uh, concert. And, and that was it. Here we could, uh, it was free. The only expense was uh, to send out flyers and, uh, and we were launched. And the first concert of dance was uh, July, 1962. And we were, we were in like Flynn. <laughs> not, not Michael Flynn, different Flynn. Just yeah, for the youth. Out I, I there. don't know who is that Flynn in like. I don't know Flynn. either. I just know it's not Michael Flynn. Yeah, yeah. Um, shall we look at some pictures? Since uh, a lot of the pictures that I pulled for us today are from Judson, so from this period. Uh huh. Just so that our audience can see what we're looking at. Oh, yeah. somebody yeah. says it's Errol Flynn. Just FYI. Errol well. Flynn. <laughs> Maybe it's Errol <laughs> Flynn. Oh uh, well. This first one, uh, what's that from a, a duet between Trisha Brown on the right and I'm on the left. Um, it, this was not at Judson, it was uh, somewhere else. But anyway, um, it was in the early 60s. And uh, we're, we're, <laughs> we're wearing black tights and uh, Hollywood Vassarette push up brassieres and <laughs> that was a very radical costume um, for that time. Um, what is that dance? Um, it's very early dance, a duet. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Becomes part of terrain, right? Uh, terrain, you're right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, which was an, uh, my first evening length dance. So that was 1963. This was around the same time. And, and the second one with me on the floor looking through, I guess that's Trisha's arms. And uh, I don't know who is in the background. Uh, terrain uh, for five or six people. And uh, it had different sections. Uh, this mm -hmm. is probably the the end toward the end of the dance yeah mm -hmm. nick can we see the the next couple of slides uh, uh this is a dance i did at a concert in the judson gym in 1963 it's called we shall run it's for 12 people and again this is a uh, you know those early those very early concerts uh, were not always documented. This is um, at uh, the Wadsworth Athenaeum. I'm in mm -hmm. front in the white t-shirt. Lucinda Childs is in the uh, dress in the back. And uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, but originally it was 12 people uh, to uh, book, uh, one of the books to who books to who to I don't know is a very flamboyant orchestral piece from the 19th century and uh, so all we're doing is running around separating reconvening for about it, it lasts about seven and a half minutes uh, and we're all dressed we are all in bare feet uh, when that dance yes. is done now we wear uh, sneakers yeah that was one of the things I wanted to ask you about that. When did you decide to make a move to wearing sneakers? Pretty early. Um, mm -hmm. Trio A was done in sneakers. Yeah, 64, 65. Mm -hmm. This is okay. the year before, yeah. So relatively soon after. Um, one of the, the things uh, as a, an art historian, you know, I'm always making like a pattern recognition thing. And so I always think about when starlings flock together and then start to create patterns in the sky. It's called a murmuration. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I was very curious about this. I know that you are, are cautious about ascribing imagery to your work, but this is something that I've often wondered about. And so I'm thrilled to have a chance to ask you about this. Did this ever, did this image ever come up for you? This idea of the murmuration? Uh, yeah, my relation to nature. Uh, I've, uh, I've never liked performing outdoors for one thing. And uh, 
um, this particular predilection goes back to when I studied with Anna Halperin on the West Coast mm -hmm. in uh, mm -hmm. 1960. And uh, she was taking uh, branches of trees and uh, running around and doing various things. Uh, very uh, much involved with the nature that uh, surrounded her outdoor dance deck. And mm -hmm. um, I, when I got into my own work, I uh, would carry things, but never a tree branch. It would be a tin can or a weight or, uh, yeah, I was into objects, but things you got in the hardware store. Um, so I've never had a very strong connection to uh, uh, nature, but yeah, you're right. Uh, the way birds, uh, flocks of birds uh, uh, separate and come together and swirl, that, that dance uh, has, uh, can be compared to that. But I, I don't think I was, uh, I was thinking of floor space, you know, in mm -hmm. interior spaces. Mm -hmm. So a very pragmatic way then of thinking about how you might cover space. Yeah, yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that's really interesting for our participants about this dance as well, you can see a more contemporary um, rendition of this dance. It's, it's out there on YouTube um, because it was performed for the MoMA Judson Dance Theater exhibition that was held in 2018, 2019. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Yvonne and several of her, her dancers are commenting on it as the dancers are dancing it and they keep getting further and further apart. And at a certain point, Yvonne, you say something like, get back together, get back together. Um, because they're, they're meant to be clustered super, super tightly so that the mm. people in the middle actually have a hard time running. Mm. Um, so it's almost then this, this pushing against the constraints against running as you're running. Mm. Hmm. Well, you may be thinking of diagonal uh, where we run their movements back and forth on diagonal. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know whether was I in this performance? You no, said? no, this was a, a more recent one, but you're, you're oh, watching oh. them perform and commenting oh, um, oh, along with people oh, like Pat okay. Catterson and the, yeah, the curator yeah. at MoMA. Uh -huh. Okay, mm -hmm. I don't remember that, yeah. <laughs> um, Nick, can we see the next slide? Mm. So okay. this is yeah. parts of some sextets. This is clearly not, um, necessarily at Judson, right? Because we're seeing a proscenium stage here. Yeah, it was originally performed at Judson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and this probably is, oh, this may be at the Wadsworth Athenaeum. Yeah, a much smaller a congested space. Mm -hmm. um, and this is the very end of the dance. Uh, it's for 10 people and 12 mattresses and uh, it ends with us all clustered, ju having jumped one at a time onto the mattress and for, as though for a portrait. And that's the end of the dance. But it was revived uh, last year uh, uh, at uh, this venue in, uh, we're in Brooklyn um, with a whole new set of uh, performers, of course. But I can uh, identify uh, from the left, Robert Morris, Lucinda Childs, me, in back of me is Steve Paxton, Deborah Hay, um, Tony Holder bending over and uh, sorry, names escape me. Um, yeah. On the far right is Robert Rauschenberg, of course. Oh, right. Yeah, he was in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Rauschenberg and Morris are also in the picture on the left. They're the people um, rolling and being rolled up in the mattresses. Oh, oh, over here. Here we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, Judith Dunn and uh, um, uh, Joseph Schlichter on the far right are walking downstage. Uh, Rauschenberg is rolling up a mattress. Uh, yeah. Um, 
Well, it had, um, I had a very detailed score on graph paper uh, for uh, all the moves, but um, the cues for changes were every 30 seconds in a recitation or a reading by me uh, in voiceover uh, from uh, the diary of William Bentley, who was a pastor in Salem, Massachusetts in the late uh, 18th century, early 19th century. And no, yeah, right. 17, late 1700s, early 1800s. Mm -hmm. And um, about all the goings on in the uh, village, including uh, sea monsters and storms and an elephant came to town. I, I spent about five weeks in the public library. There were 40 volumes published uh, uh, of this man's, uh, during this man's tenure. Uh, and he described in detail everything that went on in this village. And so I, I went through, I didn't go through 40 volumes, but I went through uh, a number of volumes and chose particular uh, entries. Um, uh, some of them kind of hair raising like a, uh, a cancer, ate away half his face and, uh, and uh, uh, all kinds of uh, extreme things, but then a lot of very everyday things. And we have word cues that we listen to and uh, uh, which are cues to change. Like sometimes the whole scene would change where people um, did like here you see on the left, we're doing a unison, uh, three of us are doing a unison movement. Uh, Cindy Childs and Tony Holder are doing this duet in the foreground. Uh, Rauschenberg is repositioning uh, the mattresses, et cetera. So that goes on. I, I was able to, with uh, a lot of help and, and uh, the instigation of Emily Coates, who has danced with me for 20 years. Uh, she went out to the Getty Research Institute and uh, dug up all my notes about this dance. I couldn't have uh, done it without her. And uh, uh, originally it took two months of rehearsal and it says something about uh, the economy at that time that um, most of us had part-time jobs. Uh, we could live on very little. Uh, Steve Paxton was paying $40 a month. I was paying, or I was also. Uh, I, I mean, uh, so I could get all these people together uh, about three times a week for a couple of months. I mean, is a whole different story today. Um, uh, Performa, which is a, an agent, uh, uh, raised money for this and uh, the Rauschenberg Foundation uh, contributed. Um, uh, it was over $60,000 to put this thing together, but uh, it was interesting. Uh, and I wouldn't have done it on my own. Uh, Emily uh, was certain it could be done in a fraction of the time, and she was right. Yeah. Um, let me make sure she's finished speaking. Sorry, my, my connection just blipped out there for a moment. Okay. We can, we Looking can at these. Now. Okay, great. Looking at these images that include people that art, artists and art historians know, like Robert Morris and Robert Rauschenberg, um, it makes me curious about your relationship to the art world in this period. And I know this is something, of course, that art historians have written quite a bit about recently. But I, I was curious about how are you how are you consuming images at this point? Are you are you thinking about the artworks that these two men were making, or are they just um, part of your medium? 
I, I came to New York on the heels of uh, a painter, Al Held, who introduced me to uh, all these visual artists. So I was, um, and uh, I was absorbing all these ideas about uh, uh, abstract expressionism. He was that kind of painter. Uh, this was uh, 1956. And so I've been around the art world. I certainly was and at that point before I ever uh, had an inkling that I would uh, be involved in some in dance. Um, and then uh, I recall I went to the Castelli Gallery around 1957, 58, and it was a, a very early show of Rauschenberg and uh, the goat with the tire and the chicken mm -hmm. on top of the painting. And I nearly rolled on the satellite floor <laughs> in, in laughter. And I was hooked on uh, this uh, intervention in, in uh, what had become a kind of staid uh, uh, art world. Uh, uh, expression, the uh, abstract expressionism. Uh, so yeah, my early work really uh, was intertwined with uh, ideas and uh, uh, challenges in, in the art world. Um, but, um, you know, that gradually uh, fell away as I matured in my own right. And, uh, um, but Rauschenberg certainly was, uh, he, he was, uh, kind of, he was Cunningham's um, scenic designer. I, I mean, he did things like iron shirts on a ironing board in one of his pieces. And he lit uh, my first evening length uh, dance at Judson. And he was around, he was a force, uh, you know, he's very interested in, in and he, of course, he began to make his own performances at a certain point. So, uh, and we uh, were kind of the, uh, some of us at Judson became kind of the tail of his comet uh, and uh, 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 went to festivals and where we all performed, he also. Um, yeah, um, but uh, I, you know, I'm not that close to uh, visual artists. Uh, when, since I came back from making films in around 2000, uh, I returned to my dance ideas and um, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, the, the feature length films are not something that I've included in this slideshow. Um, that was not something that Donna and I had discussed. Although if the participants are interested in, in talking about that, I'll ask them to ask you those questions. However, I do have two images of um, some of your early shorter films. This is mm. hand movie on the screen. Um, mm -hmm. uh, these are shot in eight and 16 millimeters. I think this is eight millimeters. Yes. And so this is a hand um, performing a, a certain type of, of, I guess, a dance um, for it, itself. It, it was spontaneous. In fact, I was in the hospital undergoing a very serious surgery. Uh, and a friend came with an eight millimeter camera and I was in bed prone and I just put my hand up uh, against the wall evidently and just started manipulating my fingers and uh, yeah it's about uh five minutes ten minutes i don't know yeah uh, this is remarkable to me because your hands move in ways that i don't think my hands move <laughs> really 
Uh, this first one you can't do. Uh, the first one I can uh, do, but um, uh, the, the that top right, I'm not sure that I can I can cross my fingers that way. I, I'm positive uh, that all of our our audience members are attempting uh, it right now as they're as they're sitting I, I, there. With I can't them. do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my fingers are not that flexible. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I've also included just an image of one of Richard Serra's hand movies, um, just so that everybody understands that Yvonne is, is very prescient in terms of this, uh, this idea of, of filming the hand and, mm. and the pragmatics of the hand, mm. what the hand can do. Mm. Um, here are images of Trio A. This is, mm -hmm. um, once again, probably your most famous work and and the one that you were saying earlier that you you feel quite protective of and, mm -hmm. and quite um, interested in seeing how it's performed. Mm -hmm. And um, then if we move Nick to the next one, um, this mm -hmm. is this is my favorite of your films. This is trio film. <laughs> um, and so uh, the trio here are Steve Paxton and Becky Arnold, and then this absolutely gigantic balloon that gets passed back and forth between our performers who manage to, to keep it together for the bulk of the film until at the very end, um, Paxton starts jumping up and down with the balloon. And of course his genitalia starts bouncing up and down as well. And then because he's jumping up and down on the sofa, then Becky Arnold's breasts start to, to jump up and down. And so all of them actually wind up having this, this moment where they're participating in balloonic movement in this really, really wonderful Ballo way. Balloonic. <laughs> <laughs> And and Becky Arnold starts just laughing. She can't she yeah. can't hold it together at this point and just yeah. starts yeah. cracking up um, yeah. in yeah. this really really wonderful wonderful way, which I think is probably why it's my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, the the hand movie and and trio film make me wonder. Actually, um, they're they're pretty sexy films. Um, and there is an element of sexuality that runs through the course of your work, even as we as we think about perhaps the deadpan or the banal or the quotidian, mm -hmm. there is still a way too that they are remarkably, remarkably sensual. Mm -hmm. And so I was I was curious about that too, about um, just, you know, were you thinking about sexuality in this moment? I, I know certainly in your later filmic work you you were and and how you you felt that this might express such a sensuality. Hmm. Not overtly. Um, uh, you know, the mattresses, the mattresses were important to me, not just as inert, uh, heavy objects that affected movement because they were hard to lift and et cetera, et cetera. But because of the, all their connotations with sleep, illness, death, sex, uh, et cetera. Um, so it was uh, these other meanings or subliminal meanings were there and I didn't have to uh, bring them to the fore. Uh, mm. I, I I left them alone. Um, so I uh, uh, I made a what I considered a semi uh, pornograph. Oh, um, uh, that balloon film was shown uh, at a, a Broadway theater. I was invited to. Uh, participate in this festival around, I don't know, the late 60s. And uh, at one part of it, there's a line, there's a uh, photo somewhere, a line of people uh, who are just moving their rib cages. But um, on, one, on the side, on one proscenium, uh, is this uh, balloon, the trio film. Uh, and uh, on the other side, I, I was there for three nights of this performance. And I think on the other side, I forget, 
but I sneaked in a pornographic film on uh, uh, video and uh, I gave it to the projectionist before, oh, the, I don't know, the, the last performance. And it was actual copulation, uh, a very scratchy old uh, film. And uh, the management uh, had a hissy fit, and be, but it showed and asked the projection as a star. I don't know, it was a big commotion. And um, uh, finally, after about two or three minutes, it, uh, they stopped the projection. But I had my porno pornography on one side and this uh, asexual trio film on, on the other. So I got in a little sex there. But yeah, I never, um, there is a, a, a sensual duet in, uh, in Terrain, that 1963 mm -hmm. evening length work where uh, Bill Davis and I uh, have very close contact and roll around on each other, but it, it isn't explicitly sexual, it's uh, essential, I guess, yeah. But I rarely, uh, oh, and then there are clusters of people and it's a lot of touching, but not of a sexual nature, yeah. And then finally, I just wanted to ask you for my last question about your relationship to politics. Um, I, you know, there's been a lot of attention to your early work and and um, looking at it to see if, if it can be queered, um, which I think is an important way to start mm -hmm. to read it, particularly Trio A has been read um, in terms of its asynchronous quality um, as, as you know, a way of thinking about choreography that's slightly and deliberately out of step and so owning its asynchronicity. Um, but then if Nick, we move on to just the last couple of slides, we might think about um, Trio A performed as Trio A with flags. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here performed in the nude, but um, people wearing flags across, um, are tied around their necks and then down across their torsos. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, Yvonne, I believe this is you in the front on the left. Yeah. Um, this was performed for the flag show at Judson Church, which was um, developed by Faith Ringgold, among others. Mm -hmm. um, this is a response to the Vietnam War. And then, was, well, specifically, it was the response to the arrest of uh, a yeah. gallerist mm -hmm. who had shown a, a, a sculptor's work that involved the flag. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, uh, it was a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court and was thrown out. Uh, for, for, I'm, I'm terrible with names these days. Um, yeah. Um, so the um, um, Faith Ringgold and her cohorts uh, mounted this uh, Judson, this flag show at, in the sanctuary at mm -hmm. Judson. Anyone who did anything with a flag was invited and uh, her colleague, John Hendricks, invited me to do something. Mm -hmm. And here were those people who knew Trio A and, uh, and I bought some flags and we, we performed it twice, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this of course has been restaged relatively recently, in fact, um, by Stephen Petronio and his yes, company. Yes, right. Um, right. As a response actually to, to our recent government and administration in mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and then Nick, the next slide. Um, this is my personal favorite of your more political mm -hmm. actions. This is Street mm -hmm. Action M Walk. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the dancers here are walking kind of almost in a lockstep. Um, as you can see, they're holding hands. Um, and Yvonne is there in the front again. Um, and, and then uh, kind of almost like stepping over each other slightly. Uh, no, we're very close together okay. and uh, yeah, mm -hmm. walking in this, uh, in the street. Mm -hmm. um, it was a series of performances, uh, uh, what was it, against the Vietnam War. Uh, it was just one event and um, uh, we had black armbands on our left arms. You don't see that because it's, uh, you see mainly right mm -hmm. arms, yeah. 
Um, and we very slowly uh, promenaded down the middle of uh, Green Street, which was where I was living at the time. And uh, uh, some of these were my students at the School of Visual Arts. And, uh, uh, and at one point, a policeman came and uh, stood in front of us and asked us to disperse or something. And I nudged um, uh, Douglas to, uh, and uh, uh, what's her name, famous dancer, um, in the three of us in the front to move slowly over to the left so we were on the sidewalk. And this is about, uh, I don't know, close to 20 people in this uh, formation. And by the end of it, we snaked around Soho. And uh, by the end of it, everyone behind us had fallen away, unbeknownst to us in the front. And I was sore for, you know, a week after that because it was a kind of side to side motion. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. And um, so called M Walk because of Fritz Lang's Metropolis or yes. M Walk for yes. some of them? Okay. Yes, it's the, the automaton factory workers leaving the factory. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to ask you about this. Did you always feel that your work was political and then these were just overtly political statements or did you actually make a conscious decision to make political work? Uh, there are two kinds of political. My work was political in terms of dance history. Mm -hmm. And when I wanted to deal with a larger uh, area of, uh, of politics, I had to go into film because I was not going to uh, turn to drama or tell stories or narration, narration. And it was film that would enable me to use language uh, and, and refer to specific uh, um, incidents that were happening uh, like uh, well, the very first was my third film, Christine the Talking Pictures. And it was uh, uh, one of the main themes was about oil pollution and the, these oil freighters that ran aground and polluted vast uh, swaths of, uh, of land. Um, so film preoccupied me from uh, Oh, actually, 72 to uh, 95, yeah. Um. And then, Nick, let's just go to the very last image, if you don't mind. Um, so I just want to leave you with the most recent dance that Yvonne has created that I'm aware of. Um, you will correct me. Uh, this was a, a dance created for everyone. Um, so itself a possibly political movement, um, passling and jostling while being confined to a small apartment that ran in the New York Times, mm -hmm. um, in which people are encouraged to walk through their apartment. And uh, if, if they bump each other, they bump each other and that permits them then to, to start a new movement, which I think then throws all the way back to things like diagonal and we shall run. Mm -hmm. Is that a real dog? On it board? is, it is. Um, <laughs> for, for those of you who have not looked at this, this article online, I encourage you to go there, use this link because there is a little film that runs and the dog is adorable. Uh -huh. Pablo. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, it's mainly walking, uh, keeping up a walk and, uh, and standing still and you can be nudged into walking again when someone bumps your partner bumps into you. Mm -hmm. And you, have you performed this recently? I myself? Yes. Uh, no, no. Uh, yeah, I haven't. <laughs> I feel like I perform this every morning with my- Oh, dad. yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's easy to perform it unknowingly, especially, especially in our, uh, my partner and I, uh, in our narrow, kitchen yeah <laughs> it's good for new yorkers yeah 
Well, Yvonne, thank you so much for answering my questions yeah. so generously. I'm going to ask Sophia now to turn it over to our participants so that they can ask you questions as well. Yeah, thanks all of you for your patience, my God. <laughs> thank you for your candor um, and for having such a titillating conversation with Amanda. We have a ton of questions rolling in, um, I think from, from friends and strangers. Uh, so I'm gonna just start passing the mic around and if anyone would prefer for me to read the question, um, that's fine too. I'll just, I'll default to passing you the mic and you can opt out. Um, so Sarah, Sarah's iPhone, you had a few questions. Um, I'm going to ask you to turn your mic on. You see a little, a little prompt? Yes. There you are. Okay. Hi, Yvonne. This is Sarah Rosenthal. I am loving this uh, event are so you, much. Are you, are you on screen? I'm not because I'm, I'm not disposed. <laughs> uh, okay. I'm sort of in the costume that you were wearing with your, your, uh, Okay, I your got dance you. with Trisha Brown. <laughs> yeah, right. it, it's fabulous, but my, everybody might not think so. Anyway, um, let's see. Yeah, I had two questions. I think you could take your pick. I'll just ask both of them. One is, I've read a lot about, you know, your relationship to chance versus choice, and how you navigated that coming out of. Uh, your work with Cage and Cunningham. So I'd really be interested in hearing your current thoughts about what that those distinctions mean to you in your work. And the other question it, that I'm wondering is, um, I, I've read about how dance in the era when you were young coming up was sort of a a way for women to kind of push their way into the postmodern art world, which according to this line of historicity or reasoning was still fairly male dominated. And I'm wondering if that felt true to you in the time, did you and your women choreographer friends think about that? Were you, you know, aware of that? Do you see it that way? So those are my two questions. Uh, did you say camp versus what? Camp. Choice and chance. Oh, choice and chance. Oh, of course. Uh, well, uh, the, the basis at, at first of the uh, uh, Robert Dunn workshop was to display a, uh, a chance procedure of a particular work of John Cage and uh, those of us who were so disposed applied that schema to uh, I, in particular, to my first solo. Uh, I made the the movements, but the way they went together uh, uh, followed whatever the chance procedure, uh, which. Uh, was uh, pretty much dots, imperfections on a page or throwing dice or uh, whatever. So, uh, but by the time I had made a couple of solos and maybe a duet, that way of thinking about sequence um, had pretty much uh, uh, had an effect on me, influenced me, and I, I felt I was able to uh, uh, go on without actually throwing dice, etc. cetera. Um, so, um, so what was your interest in bringing in more intentionality than say Cage did? Intentionality, well, um, you know, Cage was a big influence and whether we used his techniques or not, uh, the idea of uh, the correspondence be between his bringing in uh, uh, found sounds, for instance, and us looking out the window to find uh, movement in the streets. I, I mean, this was a very pervasive and influential uh, way of working. And so I, I would say, uh, 
I mean, it influences me to this day uh, in, in terms of uh, an indeterminate, uh, my recent work, uh, since I returned to dance, uh, the sequence of events uh, is indeterminate. Uh, the uh, performers can choose when they do particular uh, choreographed uh, movement. Um, so, um, um, I think my generation, uh, uh, Lucinda Childs is an exception. She makes very precise uh, schematic drawings, uh, which, uh, and the, uh, and adapts them. Uh, uh, the, there's no choices left up to the performers at all. Uh, yeah, but, uh, um, in my case, I, I've been a bit looser with uh, some of these early ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and what was the second? The other question was um, was about whether you agree that did you were you thinking were you aware when you were young when you were in your twenties coming up in the art world in New York. Did you feel what? Did you feel that the art world was dominated? Was sort still sort of patriarchal? Did you feel that it was dominated more by male artists? Did you have any sense of dance being like a segue, like a kind of a a, a way to get in the door, or yeah. was that just well, kind of not on your mind? I'm just curious how you relate yeah. to that whole discussion. Well, you're talking about feminism, and when I yeah. became aware of certain uh, inequalities in the art world and dance world, uh, um, I wasn't, although uh, early on in the mid 60s, um, I, I would, I was aware of, uh, I wouldn't call them sexist because I, that concept uh, hadn't been really introduced in, to my consciousness at least. Uh, how do you get a body into the air? So it's usually a female body that is uh, raised by one man or two men. And I re tried to challenge this by a man and woman getting a man into the air. So mm -hmm. there was aesthetically, uh, I, I was uh, uh, challenging certain norms in, in especially in classical dance. Um, but well, I guess I guess I, what I'd be interested in is like you are such an artist, you're such a creator, you're such an idea person. Would you do you think that if um, in a different era, if everything were open to everybody, might you have become a painter, a sculptor? Is no, so you know? Do, no. no, absolutely okay. not. I have no okay. talent for drawing or doing anything like that. So the body was definitely key, central for you. Right. And, I, and I've and i always been uh, ab, abhorred, is that the word? Abhorred yeah. the notion of having stuff around, like a studio full of paint cans and wood. Come on. <laughs> That's not, I love the empty studio, right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. I'd love to hear from some of the other uh, people. There's so many great questions lined up. Thanks, Yvonne. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so next we're gonna go to Jillian, um, who is actually the Rails Dance Editor. Uh, Let's see. Hello, hello. Thank we're, you, Yvonne. Are... Thank oh, you. Jillian, okay, so I see you. Hello, hello. Hi, hi. Um, I wanted to ask about um, the kind of recent and not so recent focus from dance historians, art historians, curators on Judson and the individual um, artist um, who made it up and what you think about the way the history and legacy has been portrayed, what people have gotten wrong, what has been overemphasized. 
um, and any ways that you would like the legacy to be written about or remembered Cor going Corrected. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes. Uh, good question. Uh, well, too often for people who never saw anything there, um, they think it's all about minimalism, mm. running and walking. And there are, you know, overall, even in the two or three years in which I was involved, uh, there must have been close to 300 participants. And there was no, uh, um, there were no rules about uh, what was, uh, Tricia Brown all, used to say that she didn't use the, uh, abilities of her own body, which were astounding until much later because mm -hmm. she felt there were, uh, there was a prejudice against dance. And I never felt mm -hmm. that, you know? Uh, I was uh, integrating formal dance and running and or making a couple of pure, uh, e even my running dance, uh, there was this, uh, histrionic piece of music with it to make a contrast. Uh, it's very theatrical, even though the only movement was uh, running. Uh, so there are all kinds of things at, at Judson. Uh, uh, my favorite series of evenings was uh, with the sculptor, uh, a collaboration with the sculptor, uh, what was his first name, Ross. Um, where he uh, contributed these two uh, huge uh, structures, one like a, a, a frame and a, a, for swings, but with no swings. It was trapezoidal and uh, we, a bunch of us, uh, we each made things for this particular structure. Um, um, and uh, th there were so many different sensibilities. It's hard for me to even, uh, I, I mean, I, I know I missed some of the concerts, but they certainly, to sum up that whole era as uh, part of minimalism is a, a gross misconception. Thank you. Wonderful, thanks so much. Um, so we're gonna hand the mic over to Craig from Judson now. Uh, Craig, you should be able to- Hi, good afternoon. Um, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Amanda and Sophia and, and um, Yvonne, especially for this wonderful um, day. I mean, usually I come into these Zoom meetings and by the end this far in, I'd be drained, but actually I have more energy now than when we started. Oh. Uh, your your name is familiar. You yeah, I'm from Judson, back? Yvonne, and we've I, I helped uh, organize the uh, 50th anniversary of Judson Dance Theater event at Judson uh, uh, seven or eight years ago. Ah, okay. Yeah, hi. Yeah. hi. Um, and I think Jillian's question pretty much encompassed what I was going to ask, so um, I really don't have much to add. Uh, I was going to add uh, one thing, though. Um, that a lot of Judson's archives are at the Fales Library in uh, at NYU at the Bob's Library, and uh, of course most of many more things would be found at the Lincoln Center or a Library for the Performing Arts. But um, if if somebody's just about to embark on a scholarly uh, work on uh, Judson Dance Theater or Yvonne, you might want to look at Fales also in case you haven't uh, already uh, known about that. Uh, mm -hmm. So. I really don't have anything else to add to what Jillian asked. So mm. thank you. My archive, uh, the bulk of it is at the uh, Getty Research Institute in LA. Aha, uh -huh, okay, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, 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 uh, good thing to know. Thank you. Um, and Craig, thank you for all of the information and um, sort of beautiful moments you were able to share with us through the chat. I'll make sure Yvonne can see that after this conversation. Uh, okay, so Katie, you asked an interesting question in the chat, and folks, don't worry, I'm coming coming through all the questions today, um, but passing you the mic now. Hello, yeah. everyone, um, and I just want to Hi. thank you for being on this event. It's been um, very fantastic. Um, I've been listening 
um, whilst I've been cooking dinner because it's yeah quarter past six uh, seven oh. sorry here in the UK um, yeah so I run the Dance Art Journal which is a, a dance writing collective that basically um, writes about the work of independent dance artists um, because mainstream publications here in the UK um, mainly focus on like you know the work of established artists and and um, and ballet um, and a big concern for independent dance artists, um, and I'm not sure if this is applicable in, in, in the US, but there is a huge pressure, um, yeah, to follow trends, to fulfill lots of criteria, uh, particularly when it comes to securing funding um, and getting work. Um, how do you think this is perhaps problematic, Yvonne? Um, especially as, is, is there the danger for some artist's work to be shaped by tick box requirements and not necessarily through their own interests? And I think Ian, you picked it up exactly that, you know, how is anything new to be created if we're, you know, following a trend? And that, that is really the concern um, because for independent artists, this is, you know, it, it's very, very difficult and the pandemic has unfortunately um, made that even more so. So that's you're, a, quite a big question. <laughs> you're talking about financing um yeah and and perhaps um mainly really how um you know there's um i don't know like there is a danger that in order to, to secure um to, 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 to secure work um and and funding that is it become it's becoming a little bit more of a tick box exercise um you know, I have, have an example, um, you know, we applied to do an event and we were called Too Niche, um, to, even though- To what? To what? Too niche, niche, niche. Oh. Yeah, niche as in, you know, not broader. And it's sort of like, okay, but- Not avant-garde or what? Not uh, I, I don't know, they weren't, <laughs> they, they weren't specify. elaborate on any more of that, so- Oh. Yeah, I've uh, never heard that one as a reason. It's a problem here. Um, yeah. uh -huh. So I don't know if you had any thoughts, but yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know how to deal with that. I didn't get my first big grant until I'd been working for almost ten years, and then I got a Guggenheim, and uh, um, so uh, you know when we started out, it was so easy uh, economically, uh, as I said, to uh, live. Um, I, I didn't even, we didn't even ask each other how we made a living, you know? Um, and uh, part-time jobs or parents helped or whatever. Um, and I, I've, I'm, of course, I'm aware that I, didn't know that some people were under hardship. It wasn't, it just wasn't talked about. And um, then uh, somehow I was quite lucky. My work gained attention and I was able to get more grants. And, uh, uh, and then um, when I went into film, again, there were opportunities, uh, each film, the expenses doubled, tripled until uh, I, I knew that the kind of work I did, uh, I could no longer afford. Uh, 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 the, the grants had dried up. And so I don't know how younger people do it today. You know, uh, I really don't. And uh, I know they, uh, they double up in their accommodations and uh, uh, rents are in New York are ridiculous. And, uh, um, you know, it's just, it does feel like it's a bit of a vicious circle of, you know, do you, yeah. um, you know, do what's needed to, do you fulfill the requirements or do you, you know, pursue your own path and, you know, it's, um, it's not, my question isn't so much about, you know, funding, it's more, are we, is creativity or their own, the own artist's intent somewhat being compromised by perhaps larger institu institutions being like, no, you must fulfill this X, Y, Z. Okay, yeah. I'll make work based on that. <laughs> yeah. And perhaps not, you know, articulate the things that I wanted to. Yeah. So, yeah. I've been lucky with help when I needed it. And, uh, uh, 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know whether I've dealt with your issue. No, it's great. Thank you. Fantastic. Just a pleasure to be here. Mm. Thank yeah. you so much, Katie and Yvonne. Um, it's these types of exchanges that I really look forward to um, in this forum. Uh, so next we have a question from Nell. Nell, I'm going to pass you the mic. There you are. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Yvonne. What a pleasure to get to hear from you directly. I had the privilege of taking a workshop from you many years ago and feel like I still dive into my notebook for inspiration from your thoughts and uh, choreographic direction. Um, I wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about how your approach to choreographic thinking and pedestrian movement um, shifted after you'd worked in film and came back to working with the bodies in space on a stage or in, in uh, physical spaces. Um, specifically, did you see or imagine or splice movement phrasing in different ways after such a deep dive into, into film? Did you think about replays and transitions and time and juxtapositions differently? Did you think about sourcing movement ideas differently? Um, or, or were there other changes that you noticed in your own process when, when you kind of juxtaposed the, the, the two or went from film back into to, um, the more immediate experience of working with real bodies in real time and real space? Thank you. Um. I don't think I, I think I was ready, you know, to jump back in uh, after what, uh, 82, 10, 90, to over 20 years of filmmaking where I was very uncomfortable uh, with this big crew, you know, uh, technically I'm a, a dimwit and I, I never adapted to dealing with laboratories and the technicalities of filmmaking. So it was such a relief to deal with bodies again. And, uh, and I, uh, my re-entry into choreography was through uh, Barishnikov. Um, he had a small company at that point. He wanted to keep dancing. He had been coming downtown to see experimental dance uh, ever since he, had uh, come to the States. And so uh, the first work I made was uh, for this company uh, of six people uh, and he was a member of it. Uh, uh, he wanted to keep working. Um, so I, uh, with the help of Pat Catterson who um, had followed my work and uh, I had known her oh, for ages. She's a, uh, an accomplished choreographer and, uh, and she offered to help me delve into my own uh, uh, background and adapt uh, stuff I had already choreographed to this new situation with Misha. So uh, that was the beginning uh, of, uh, but this, uh, uh, so I pursued putting things together. I'd been doing that in film. Uh, somehow it was a very easy transition in terms of uh, composition. Um, I mean, I, in film, my films are full of these, what I call radical juxtapositions. Uh, and dance uh, had always uh, incorporated this kind of uh, approach. So uh, I was launched and after that uh, three, three of the, that company uh, uh, came and worked with me and are still with me uh, in my current work. Uh, yeah. So uh, the ish, the, some of the issues have changed like uh, with aging, uh, we're all well over 40. Uh, uh, and I uh, continue to like performing, but I don't move around much anymore. So I, I read stuff and uh, someone will come over with a pillow while I'm reading and lower me down to the floor and I keep reading. I, I mean, there's all kinds of monkey business uh, as I uh, 
uh, they pick up on uh, what I can do and can't do, or I do also, right in the performance. Um, but uh, when, so when I came back, let's talk about uh, 2000, uh, I, I then got an invitation to uh, uh, a series that was to be all about Stravinsky. And uh, I, uh, oh, my mind is going blank at the moment. Uh, so I had f these four dancers, uh, Pat and uh, uh, Patricia Hofbauer and Emily Coates and uh, oh, and uh, Sally Silvers. Uh, and uh, we did, um, oh yeah, I, I had been going to the ballet ever since the late 50s and, and Balanchine's uh, modernist uh, ballets particularly, I saw over and over again. So I got permission uh, from uh, New York City Ballet to uh, use uh, some images from Agon. And uh, we, uh, my dancers learned parts of Agon only instead of four men and four women, it was my four women. So um, uh, I adapted uh, and made this dance. Uh, based on Agon and uh, and so it went. I um, uh, I don't know, it, uh, one thing followed another and uh, um, hmm. Thank you. Um, we now have a question from our very own Fong Bui. PB, you got it? Welcome. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Yvonne. Hi. Hi, thank you, Amanda. I, um, of course, I, I was thinking about Abby Hoffman because I just read his autobiography and he and Kate Millett was one among others who protested in favor for the owner of the gallery's name is Stephen Raddick. Yes, yes. Yes. Thank you. And, and it was very remarkable because people flat show uh, went to Supreme Court, which remind me so much of our late friend, the beloved Jonas Makers, Yvonne. Oh yeah. So I also, you know, who also have gone to Supreme Court on Jean Genet film, not to mention Jack Smith, Flaming Creature. Oh, oh yeah. So I want to ask a little question about Jonas, what your relationship with, with Jonas and before Anthology Film Archive was created in 1968, it was yeah. a scene of cinema tech. Mm -hmm. Jonas was very emerged in the fluxit scene and yeah. everything else in between, particularly yeah. experimental yeah. film. So, well, even before I came to New York, I was going to uh, the Modern Art Museum in San Francisco. Uh, to look at uh, Maya Darren films and uh, I maybe, I don't know whether I saw Jack Smith films there, but uh, the, the new American, so-called new American cinema. And, uh, and, and I continued this through, through anthology film archives that Jonas ran. And one of the early venues was in uh, Soho before it was called Soho and I lived right up the street from and yeah. I and I saw all these uh, films experimental films of uh, uh, especially Hollis Frampton and uh, the Canadian what's his name Michael Snow Michael Snow thank you um, so I, I was very familiar with this kind of work so my transition and my short films were certainly influenced uh, in, in the uh, uh, late 60s, I guess, influenced by uh, these films. Mm -hmm. uh, so when I transitioned to uh, uh, feature length filmmaking, uh, I, I felt I was uh, filling up a, a hole that these experimental filmmakers had 
uh, intentionally avoided, and that was narrative. So I combined uh, I was in uh, the, some of their strategies, editing strategies and whatever, mm -hmm. with um, uh, a, a reworking of narrative uh, tropes, you might say. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah but that, they were very important to me, yeah. And, you know, I was thinking also uh, about your um, manifesto, you know, I mean, oh I, dear, oh dear. <laughs> no, but I had to bring it up, Yvonne, because I know at one point in my life I I memorized them. Because it was, uh, it was I, uh, let me ask you: Do you know the corrections that I made years later, or do you only know the original? I think I know the original. No to spectacle. Yeah. No to okay. Curiosity, and I don't. Okay. I remember it well, no to spectacle. I made a whole list in response to each one of those. So maybe no to spectacle, and then on the other side of the page, a little bit goes a long way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, that's it. But Yvonne, but you know, okay. So that was written initially in mid 60, 1965. And, and I know that Richard Sarah Verbless was written in between 67, 66, I think. Not that different from, from Richard's own movie, you know, Hand Catching Lad, that was 68. Yeah. Yeah. And that was very inspired by your hand movie, 66. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I know that Richard, we actually uh, hosted his films and video retrospective at Anthology, Film Archives last year. And there was a panel on it, and there was clearly that Richard had deep admiration for you. Mm. So, was there a, a real true rapport in that time that you must have seen Richard or vice versa quite regularly? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I, well, when I, no, 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 no. Of course, I knew Richard. I mean, I went to loft parties, and he would be there, and. Uh, uh, I remember a, a, a screening of one of my short films uh, was projected and I was sitting on the floor right next to him and he was laughing and uh, yeah, uh, he was an important uh, figure in that milieu and uh, um, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You guys were friends. You guys were friends. Yeah. All right. I have one last well, question. Well, not close friends, but associates. Uh, we uh, admire, admired each other. We're professional friends, let's say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Yvonne. My last question, I have many, but I, I don't want to take too much time. It, it's, my, um, it's about Judith Molina and Julian Beck living theater. Yeah. Was there a a relationship you had? Uh, absolutely. Uh, not with them personally, but I uh, went to see everything that they did. And uh, uh, they were they were on the corner of uh, 6th Avenue and 14th Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Moorst Cunningham studio was on the top floor of that building. And so it was very convenient to come down and, and go to screenings. Um, and uh, okay, I, I have this, uh, even before, I saw their stuff even before uh, I entered into a, I knew I was going to be a professional choreographer. Um, I had gone to a performance uh, that James Waring had organized and uh, a dancer named uh, um, Yvonne, yeah. anyway, um, uh, I'd gone with a friend of mine, uh, George Sugarman, a sculptor, oh. and uh, to see this dance concert, and I'll think of her name. She there's a solo. Uh, she came out in an elaborate um, dress with a bustle and in a throne-like chair, and uh, humped around and drew her breasts and her features with a pencil, uh, like so. And uh, at the end of it, uh, 
my friend George uh, leaned over and said, you could do that. <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, I, I, but she was a, Eileen Pasloff. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, uh, better late than never. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I went to where I knew she was uh, study, taking class and, uh, and she encouraged me to take class with James Waring. And what do you know, after a year of studying with him, he invited me into his company and I, I was launched. And uh, he organized a, a series of concerts at the Living Theater and I performed my first solo yeah, on that stage in the living theater. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. You, That's amazing. <laughs> you know, it just shows all the interconnections uh, that were going on there then. Uh, yeah. Well, that's one of the conditions that we're trying to do what we do at the Brooklyn Rail is to uh, try to generate and foment in the cross pollination which in the academy don't quite offer enough. Uh, everyone yeah. is, you know, niche in their own specialized field. So this is why we do oh. what we do. So thank you for coming on and taking your time to be with, with us, among us, Yvonne. Yeah. We're very grateful. My pleasure. Thank you. It's so been much. our great pleasure. And now we all have the pleasure of a reading. Uh, from Jason P. Smith. So maybe I'll introduce them and hand over the mic and then stick around because we'll have a chance to all sort of say goodbye to each other at the end. Um, so interdisciplinary artist, writer, and curator. Their work is interested in Black performance, collaboration, and somatic practice. Jay has received support from New York Foundation for the Arts in 2010, 2017 for Poetry and the Poetry Project, among others. And they currently live in Brooklyn. So Jason, I'm going to pass you the mic. Thank you, Sophia. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Yvonne uh, and Amanda, for this beautiful conversation. Uh, thank you all, everyone, for sticking around. Um, I am going to read a few poems and then be out of your way. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Here's a thing that I've been working on for uh, some time. Uh, <clears throat> this comes from a line uh, from Tongo Eisen Martin, who is the uh, new poet laureate uh, out in San Francisco. Um, the, line, the title of this poem is, I will be half eaten my entire life. <clears throat> the day was devoid of coercion and it was good, except for the shape of it. Dawn hems in faltered fathers, artificial and assembled to pass time refusing to die. Sometimes there is study. Sometimes we make it downtown isopropyl lined anecdotes and your blighted birds. Talent kept it eponymous. The abattoir just makes it interesting. I ceased witness the same day as the recycling, predictably fraught and avant-garde like no one requests. Know nothing of the poem beyond amenity, stuffed full of cells, prepositions, of light opinions and thereby professional, upset even, Look how it undulates through my applications over our antecedents until obsession starts, where the gates close and I fail to understand. Have I made a case for elegance yet? A mesmerizing language for crisis. Suffering rhetorical, I obtained through conjugation, humiliation as the grass rustles. Two more of these, thank you. Okay. This is a revision uh, of an earlier poem. Uh, do, 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 if I can find you. There we go. Cool. Um, so we were talking about Jonas Makus earlier uh, and the title of this poem actually comes from a poem that uh, Amiri Baraka uh, wrote um, about him. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is, uh, the title of this poem is Memory History Object. <clears throat> no one asks why when I say nation budged out of a metaphorical paint, 
counting steps away from, from surveillance. Before new crowns, everyone wants a simpler war story for the children, and that is one way to sublimate sorrow. Revisionists on the far side of acquisition, in all weathers, I'm most didactic, suffering or otherwise, ambition is owed. The lyric remains the lyric, whether or not you're saying anything. In this way, I have governed whether it is tomorrow or not. I say there is no art in interest. I bought something with all the ways we make do and the faux morality made me feel special. Kept the calculus of my Instagram intact. I cleave to the modernist in me like catechism, approach a kind of feeling via casual American clumsiness, or nation, noun, if I remain, what? And then last poem, thank you so much for listening. Watching Paul Mooney hum Amazing Grace post 9-11 while eating hot wings from Crown Fry. Don't try this at home by yourself. We're at war and I'm American again, sleeping at eight like shit. New, visibly cankered, coy, mythologies locked in before morning coffee. There's an order to this. A working list of what makes my teeth white, thick, chicken, everything but solitude. It's unbearable. 12 niggas going to flight school bad. And repercussion is so certain, but you knew that. Peep the joke hiding. I leave him a blues and he leaves me for dead. Who knows about being pathetic yet functional? You got shoes, I got shoes, so I suppose we should be intimate. Maybe just moan at our echoes. It's mostly productive with the punchline involved. I haven't smirked in weeks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. Um, a beautiful way to end today's wonderful event. So um, if folks would like to turn their mics on and say goodbye on the way out, you're very welcome to. We like to end in a huge cacophony. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. This was amazing. 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 Hi, Hi, Martha. Thank you. So many Craig. Wonderful thank conversation. Great talking to you, Ben. You're fun. But thank you. Love the reading, Jason. Bye, Thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Charlie. Thank you. Jason, thanks for your patience. Thank you, Thank you Yvonne. Yvonne. Thank you for yeah. being here. It was oh, lovely. Okay. It was so lovely Thank meeting you. Jason. you. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, buddy. Thank you so yeah. much.